let's talk about the hidden costs that might come when you're coding applications in the Oracle database. Costs that you think from first glance are zero or negligible and yet might actually have a hidden cost that might come back to hurt you uh, later on. Has anyone ever done this when they're writing application code? I need to know who's logged onto the database. And so we write something as trivial as this. I declare a variable called x, I begin, and I say x equals user. User sitting there in the documentation, it tells us that user is a function call that gives us the currently connected user. It's a useful piece of information that we often might need. People might be thinking, well, I don't rarely call, you know, not in something, not in trivial code like that. I don't just write x equals user. But let's build it up. Let's see how people can get into a state where they're calling PL SQL variable equals the user function and why that might be a unseen or hidden cost that might hurt your applications. Let's build it up from ground zero. I'll create a table called people. I'm, I'm an active data modeler. I'm a DBA. I'm a developer. I'm building a new application. I need to record some people. So I'm going to create a table called people. It's got person ID, forename, surname. And as so many applications require, every time I insert a row, well, you better tell me who inserted that row. I need to know, you know, for example, when it was created, who created it, etc. So we'll do something trivial like this created by a column, those extra what I call audit metadata columns that we so commonly add to tables. Created by, and I don't want to have to code this in my application, so default user. Every time you put a row in there, I'll put the default user in there. So far, so good. Of course, the very next sprint, the next scrum, the next iteration, insert trendy buzzword continuous de delivery terminology here. I need to know, obviously, when someone changes that row. Now that I've caught when someone creates a row, what if someone goes and changes those person details? I need to know when that is as well. And so I'll follow that same mindset. I'll simply go alter table people, add modified by, and that'll be default user as well. So when we insert a row, both created by and modified by, we'll both get the user. So we can assume that your first insertion is also the first modification, they're synonymous. And that looks promising until you've actually, of course, run the application. I'll connect as Scott and I'll update one of the existing rows in the people table. I'm setting the address, uh, someone's moved house, so I need to update their address. The person is 12345 and I've connected as Scott, so that's what I want to go in my modified column. And of course, when I select from the people table, I get a bit of a nasty surprise because it says it was modified by John. It wasn't modified by John. John was the person that actually inserted the row. And as most people will be aware, the thing about the default clause on a column is that it applies only on the creation of a record. Updates don't go change default columns. I could explicitly have put in there in the update statement set modified by equals default. And actually the, the actual word default, a lot of people don't know that you can actually reference the, the keyword default to go pick up the defined default value. But as I said before, often we don't want that metadata to be the responsibility of the application. The application shouldn't have to go through and change all the code to explicitly set updated by, created by, etc. Now, if the application doesn't do that, what's the solution? Yeah, you know, everyone goes, oh, I know exactly how I can do it. I'll do it with a trigger because then I don't have to touch any application code. A trigger can look after that for me. So I've got a trigger here called who did this row? And every time I insert or update, if it's inserting, I'll set the new created by. I could have got away writing this trigger without capturing the insert, just focusing on just the update and relying on the default clause. But this is a common kind of code path I'll see. If I'm inserting, I'll set created by. And if I'm updating, I'll set new modified by. And that will solve the problem because now I've overcome that issue of default clauses only being applied during an insert statement. Here is a common mantra of mine, infinity times anything equals infinity. As we said at the start, people very rarely code just PL SQL variable equals user, but they'll quite happily code that same construct inside a trigger and think nothing of it. I've done a load test here, the importance of load testing, I've done an insert, select from lots of rows. So I'm doing, for example, a data load of the people table. And I can see there, if we look at the execute line across at the right, you can see it says I inserted 80,000 rows. 
and it took eight and a half seconds. 8.63 elapsed, of which 8.56 is CPU. This thing is a 100% just about CPU intensive operation. I don't care how bad your server is, there is no way known that an 80,000 row insert should ever take eight seconds. That's insane, that's ridiculous. What was the cause? If I continue on through the trace file that actually captures this information, here's where we see a lot of the time, or a lot of the effort. I did select user from Joule, and I can see I did it 100, sorry, I did 160,000 executions of it. That is the problem with using the user function inside Peel SQL. It just so happens that the user function is not natively inside Peel SQL. So when it sees the words user, it says, oh, I can't work that out myself within the realm of the Peel SQL engine. What do I do? I'll transparently rewrite that to a select user from Joule. That way I can get it from the SQL engine. So there's a whole lot of problems going on here. Number one is you're firing a trigger, which you probably would prefer not to run, but sometimes we have to. But within that trigger, I had to jump out from the Peel SQL engine into the SQL engine such that I could work out the user variable. That's a context switch. And you can see from the trace data there that it only cost 1.1 second of CPU and the overall response time was eight seconds. The vast majority of time wasn't actually running select user from Joule. It was the Peel SQL engine going, oh, hold on, I gotta stop. I need to work out user, let's jump over to SQL. SQL says I'm done, let's come back. It's this, it's the flip-flopping that actually cost you all that time and CPU. That takes code path, takes code cycles. You might be thinking, well, how do I avoid that? I need to capture the user information. I need that user details. How do I catch that information? We just need to think a little bit outside the box. There are mechanisms in Peel SQL to extract information about your session that don't involve a transparent rewrite to select from Joule. One of those is the syscontext function. So if I make a call to syscontext from Peel SQL, that's implemented natively. So I don't need to jump out to the SQL engine to do it. Session user gives me the same information as user. Simply replacing your calls to user in Peel SQL with syscontext, you're gonna get a dramatic improvement. I'm not saying that everything you have should be replaced with syscontext. What I'm saying is, as a general rule, whenever you use any supplied function inside a Peel SQL trigger, do a quick trace on it, see if there are any select from jewels in there. If there aren't, you can be confident that it's natively implemented because it depends on your version. Syscontext also used to implement a syscontext from Joule. The UID function, I think, still does a select from Joule. Sysdate, up until about Oracle 10, used to do a select sysdate from Joule when used within a trigger. So over time, more and more functionality has been implemented natively in Peel SQL, and therefore very useful in triggers. But it depends on your version, and possibly depends on your platform. What's more important is not knowing which ones do and don't, is the ability to make sure that you always trace your code, find those hidden costs. If I rerun that same execution, the 80,000 row insert, within the trigger still enabled, but using syscontext, notice my time has dropped from eight and a half seconds down to 0 0.68 seconds. Believe it or not, that's still pretty slow for an insert because the trigger is on there. But if you have to have those triggers, if your application requires them, mandates them, then I'd still much rather have a 0.6 response time than an 8.6 second response time. Avoiding those flip-flops back and forth between the Peel SQL and SQL engine are critical in triggers to make sure that you don't get that performance hit. So as I said, regularly check your triggers in your code, do some tracing on them to make sure they're not invisibly rewriting your code to doing select from Joule because it's going to punish you. And because all SQL from Peel SQL is normalized, you'll see it in uppercase in VDollar SQL, it's pretty easy to check VDollar SQL, VDollar SQL stats to see if you've got a whole stack of uppercase versions of select something from Joule. If that's in there, there's a very good chance that it's actually some invisible function in Peel SQL that is not yet implemented natively that has been implemented by doing a select from Joule.